Let's talk about one of our real world uses of linear functions. We've got something called linear regression. So first of all, scatterplot. We've got a bunch of data values that are paired up. We can plot them out. For instance, shoe size, exam score. And you might understandably expect that's weird. There doesn't seem to be any sort of relationship that I can think of between shoe size and exam score. And our data points certainly show us that there does not seem to be a clear relationship between those. However, if we are talking about, say, the number of chirps in 15 seconds that a cricket emits versus the temperature maybe there's a relationship there. So counting the number of chirps, depending on the kind of temperature we've got going on and going, oh, well, yeah, that does have a seemingly linear relationship. Is there a way that we can codify that? Is there a way that we can be really clear about what kind of linear relationship we're seeing here? Is there something that we could say mathematically that you know supports the idea that there's no clear relationship in this particular case. So we have in this idea of using linear functions a couple of important sorts of options and terminology going on here. The line of best fit is how we would usually refer to a linear function that is going to model the data that we have collected. Now we can do this by eyeballing things, but that's not quite as mathematical as it could be when we've got algebra. <laughs> now, there is a whole sequence of calculations that can get us what we need, referred to as the, the least squares regression. But for our purposes right now, we're just going to use graphing calculator to do all of that number crunching and leave the underlying calculation work for a different discussion, one that would be more about statistics. So about that line of best fit and how we can use it. If we are looking at predicting something that is happening within the domain or range of the data that we've collected, that is inside, so we would refer to this as interpolation. If, however, we were wanting to predict something that's happening outside of that domain or range of data that we've collected, we would call that extrapolation. So outside versus inside. If we we're looking back at that graph, and we can go back to it in just a moment, in the above cricket scatter plot, we could interpolate the number of chirps for a temperature of 70 degrees. So if we backtrack to that drawing and say, well, where's the 70 degrees? Well, the lowest temperature that we're looking at seems to be right about maybe 60, or excuse me, like uh, 57, 56 degrees. The highest temperature we're looking at, 75, 76, somewhere in that neighborhood. 70 is smack in the range of our data values. Domain down here, range up here, right? So smack in the middle of that range. If we were talking about predicting how many chirps we might expect, with that temperature being 70 degrees, that's interpolation. However, if we come back to that statement and take a look at the rest of it, if we were looking instead at what temperature would we expect if we were hearing 50 chirps, well, 50 chirps, come back up and look at that graph, 50 chirps is outside, of the data values farthest we got out was 
39? That's way outside. So we would be, in that case, extrapolating what's going on if we were talking about what to expect if the number of chirps were 50 every 15 seconds, what kind of temperature would we be expecting to see? That would be an extrapolation. So let's talk about an example here and show you a little bit of about using the graphing calculator, specifically the TI-84. We have within the programming of our calculator this linear regression that can be done completely using the calculator as long as we tell the calculator what data values we have. So we've got this relatively short description of steps for how to enter those data values and how to run this linear regression feature of the graphing calculator. We are going to use this particular example here, which is about gas consumption. So for the year, we have the consumption based on billions of gallons of gasoline. And rather than inputting the year 94, 95, or even 1994, 1995, let's be smart. Let's be a little bit clever even and let's say for the first year that we've got, let's call this t equals zero. So sort of like that science idea of whenever we start counting something based on time, the first count that we're gonna do is based on t equals zero. That initial measurement. So t equals zero is gonna to correspond to the year 1994 t equals 1 would correspond to 1995 and so on we're going to want to enter this information so the first couple of steps here tell us how we're going to enter that collection of data values actually it's the first three steps really so we're going to open the statistics menu so we're going to look for a button that is labeled stat when that opens up we are going to have an edit option that appears. That is going to be the very first option that appears. So we can just go ahead and hit enter on that. So let me show you what that looks like on the graphing calculator here. We have our stat button right here. We've got that stat button. So we're gonna hit that. You can follow along with the uh, key press history that we've got showing up here. So notice there's the stat button that we hit. Here's the menu that we get. It's automatically the edit menu at the top and the highlighted option is automatically the edit that we would want to select, which means that we can hit our enter button in that lower right hand corner and get our lists that would show up. Now for the sake of this particular example, I've already put these lists in. The steps go on to say, you're going to start in the L1 column for list one you're going to enter those values these are going to be the time values because we want a function that has the consumption being spit out based on the time or the year so year is going to go first so year zero year one year two year three and we can use the down arrow we can use the enter button whichever one so the down arrow or the enter button that we've got to move from one row of our column, or excuse me, one, well, one row of our list to the next. So zero, down button. One, enter button, either way, it moves you down that list. Then the next step tells you once you've completed that first list, you're gonna use the right arrow button 
in order to move to list two. That should start you automatically at the top of list two, if your list two is empty, and you're gonna enter the values from that table for the consumption, 113 billion, 116 billion, and so on. So once we've got all of those entered, then we can come back and say, now what do our instructions tell us to do as far as actually running this calculation when finished? We're gonna come back to the statistics menu. So we're gonna hit that stat button again and click the right arrow to move to the calculation submenu. So let's just pause on those instructions, come back to that calculator. So we're in our list. We can just automatically hit that stat button again. There's no funny business that's gonna happen with doing that. It'll just automatically bring us right back to our stat menu. But while we started out with the edit, we now want to go on to the calculation options. So we've got to hit our right arrow button and get to this calc submenu. So this is our calculation submenu that we have. Now, according to our instructions, the one that we want to select is called Linreg. And in parentheses, it's got this AX plus B. That because of the way that we have put together our table, we want the AX plus B as opposed to any other kind of option that might be listed in there that we don't even see. There's a little arrow that says that there might be some more calculation options in here. We don't care about any of those. We want this fourth one. We can actually hit the number four or we can use our down arrow to move down to select that. I'm gonna take the easy route and hit the number four button. Now this only brings up the command this brings up the command. In order to run this calculation, I gotta come down here and hit enter. So enter. And there are the results. Now we gotta make some heads or tails of those. Now we don't need it on the calculator. I've copied that result and put it into our file here. So this is what we're looking at in our screen on the calculator. We've got this display. It's reminding us that we've got this structure y equals ax plus b. We've got an a value, a b value. There's some sort of r squared and r. Haven't talked about that. Don't know what's going on with that, but at least the a and the b that are mentioned refer back to that equation y equals ax plus b. Now if we're using our function notation and we're saying we want something that is representative of that consumption, consumption based on the time, T, and years, then we're gonna have our AX plus B. Well, it's not gonna be an X, because for our purposes, it's T for time. So the A value that we rounded for convenience times the T, the time in years, starting with zero is the corresponding to the year 1994, right? Here's our B value, again, it's rounded for convenience. Now, if we're asked to predict that gas consumption in 2008, now 2008 is not anywhere in this list, so this is not an interpolation sort of thing. 2008 is outside of our list. That's gonna be an extrapolation thing, specifically. In 2008, well, 2008 minus 1994 means that T is equal to 14. If we plug in 14, we get our value. That would mean that our model that we have come up with, with the help of our graphing calculator, predicts that there would be 144.244 billions of gallons of gasoline consumed in that year 2008 based on that collection. Now let's do an example here together. So if we scope out, well, I should say, I'm not going to do an example yet, uh, pardon me, before we get to that example, let's instead say, what about that business of how do we know whether our regression is actually any good, right? 
So there's that idea that we had mentioned of eyeballing that line of best fit. We go, well, if we're just eyeballing it, yeah. But if we're using algebra, we should be able to say, in some form or fashion, this is a good fit, this is an okay fit, and this fit's not so hot. So what's the scoop? Well, as it so happens, that's gonna be this R that shows up. So since we've still got that up on the screen, this R that shows up is called the correlation coefficient. It's a measurement of how scattered our data is. So correlation, things that are related. So it's kind of a measurement of saying, you know, how closely are things related in this linear fashion? Because we're doing a linear regression. So how do things correlate to one another? How closely do they seem to be related? That's not to say that there's like a cause and effect kind of a thing. There's just some sort of relationship there. May or may not be cause and effect, just some sort of relationship, like core relation, like with relationship, there is no clear expectation of what that relationship is, just is there a relationship? Is it weak, is it strong, is it an increasing relationship versus a decreasing relationship. So if R is positive, that suggests an increasing relationship. If R is negative, that suggests a decreasing relationship. And the deal is that the closer that we get to the negative one or the positive one, the less scattered our data is. The, the closer our data is to fitting on that line that we've calculated. 0.9965. Ooh, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty good. The closer we are to zero, the more scattered we are. So if we think back, and if you go back and take a look at that first picture about the shoe size and the exam scores, and the dots are all over the place, the more scattered our data, that correlation coefficient is going to be closer to zero. So if we actually went and took the time to do a linear regression with that information about shoe size versus exam score, we would find that that correlation coefficient is gonna be very close to zero because that was a very scattered array of data values that we had. So now for that example that I had a moment ago promised we would do Let's go ahead and put both of those ideas together of the regression line and the correlation coefficient. We just want to report this. I've got it already worked out, but let's go ahead and go into the calculator so that you can see how that stuff gets entered. And let's try to make that a little bit on the nicer side of things by returning to our returning to our blank screen and let's return to our blank key history as well and even though we've already got those lists in there we can go ahead and write over top of them so our instructions said start with the stat button we've already got the edit option selected so we're going to hit enter to get into that edit mode since they're starting us at the top of list two, we want to go ahead and hit the left arrow button so that we can start at the top of list one. According to our table, our list values start at four and end at 13. So we're going to type in, instead of the zero, we're going to type in the four. And again, we can use the down arrow or the enter button. I'm going to use the enter button personally here. So four, five, six, hitting enter after each of those entries, seven, then enter, eight, then enter, nine, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And I hit enter. And there's still that value that's left from our earlier table, that last value. So we're gonna hit the clear button 
to remove that. Now we can go ahead and go to, oh, it didn't clear that. I said clear and then enter. Nope. All right. Maybe delete. There. Delete. Enter. Okay. Delete is the thing that worked. Now, if we go to our list two, that's the right arrow button. Right arrow button. But oh, we had to move up first to an actual entry and we'll have to use our arrow button to go ahead and get all the way back up to the top of our list. So now we want to enter some other decimal values. So bear with me while I enter those in list two, starting with the 44.8, 43.1, 38 38.8 27 and 25.8. Remember, we had that one extra value from our previous list, so we're going to use the delete button to remove that entry and then hit enter. And our list, or hit the down arrow, or hit the up arrow. There we go, up arrow, do the trick. So now our list is complete and we can return to those instructions that say hit the stat button, go to the calculation submenu by hitting the right arrow, select the option number four for our linear regression, hit the enter button to execute that. And so here is our A value, our B value. We didn't talk about R squared, we don't need that, but we do have the R value showing up there. And again, I've recreated this in the notes. So we have the information here in our notes that was on the screen a moment ago. The A value, the B value, we're putting those into our linear function structure, our y equals ax plus b slope intercept form. So the a is corresponding to the slope, the b is corresponding to that y intercept. Because this table is just listed as x and y with no other extra fancy particulars, we can just go ahead and say y equals the negative 2.201x plus 53.57. Again, we're rounding those numbers from what we see on the screen just for convenience sake. If we have any specific instructions in our system, we, <coughs> excuse me, we want to make sure to follow that. But they also talked about the correlation coefficient, so that R value, negative, all right, so this is a decreasing relationship, but it's close to a negative one, so the 0.986, yeah, that's going to be pretty linear for that relationship. Again, not necessarily some sort of cause and effect. We don't know what the X is. We don't know what the Y is. There's no way for us to even try to start guessing at any kind of cause and effect relationship. It's just that whatever these things are, they are strongly linearly related to one another. The one last thing that I want to mention about this is that your calculator might not automatically be set up to report the correlation coefficient. Instead, your calculator, when you go through and try this for yourself, might list the A and the B, and then you go, what? Well, where's the rest? So let me mention how you can turn on that extra bit of good stuff. So once again, let's go ahead and clear out the screen on the calculator and clear out that key press history. If you need to turn on this business, what you are going to do is 
go into the catalog of all of the different calculator features. The catalog is all the way down here. It is the second function of your zero button. So it says in here, catalog, depending on the coloration of your calculator. That color is gonna match the second button here that's up in the upper left. So catalog, color coded to remind you that's the second feature. So we're gonna hit second and then zero to be able to bring up that catalog. It's giving it to us alphabetically. Now we already have a little alphabet indicator in the upper right corner of the screen that lets us know if we hit any of the alphabet keys, which in this particular case, those are green. So A, B, C, if we hit any of those, we can actually jump to the part of the list for that alphabet letter. We want stuff that's in the D's. So we're gonna hit this X power of negative one button to jump straight to the top of the list of D entries in our catalog. We're gonna to want to now use our arrow button to scroll down to an item that says diagnostic on. Diagnostic off, nope. Diagnostic on, there we go. So we want our little triangular arrow pointer here on the left side of each of those entries to be pointing at diagnostic on. Like the command for the linear regression, we have to hit enter once to select that option. Then we have to hit enter a second time to actually execute this command. So we're gonna hit enter one time to select that option. So it'll say on our calculator screen, diagnostic on. Now we've only selected it, we haven't run it yet. We have to hit enter a second time in order to run that. So if we hit enter the second time, it will run that. And that will then allow you to, if you go back to your previous example and your list is still there, you can run that linear regression again. And instead of just the A and the B popping up for you to do your line as a function, you will also get your R squared showing up so you can then answer any questions about correlation coefficient. So leave that diagnostic on and you should be good. You should only have to do that the one time, turning the diagnostic on and everything that you do from the homework, the quiz, anything that you might need to do on a test about linear regression, that stuff is automatically or should automatically be on and stay on for you. So that's how you can take care of that business with turning on that linear regression uh, correlation coefficient stuff.